One of the things that we didn't really have a lot of time to talk about in the last segment was the culture wars. I more or less gave you uh, um, a non nondescriptive definition, not very detailed definition of exactly what I meant when it comes to the culture wars of the 1920s. Uh, bottom line is this is a very fascinating time period from a cultural history standpoint, from um, from from a culture war standpoint. Now. <laughs> What you've got going on in the 1920s is really, really two things. One, you do have a prosperous economy, and more and more people uh, can focus on something that does not involve, you know, where's my next meal going to come from? Is the roof over my head going to be there uh, tomorrow? I don't know. So anytime you've got a situation like that, people are going to find other things to focus on, and in and, and, and culture mainstream American culture is going to be one of the things that they focus on. This won't be the last time that we talk about um, culture wars. I mean, you'll see them in uh, on the 1960s. Um, to some extent, the 1950s, although it's certainly much more uh, vivid in the 1960s, and we'll see them again in the 1990s. Um, but at any rate, what you've really got going on here, the other thing that I need you to be mindful of when it comes to the culture wars of the 20s, is a lot of social change. Uh, and you've got a lot of different things that are going on at the same time. There's a lot of different groups of Americans that are making their presence felt. Um, you've got an immigrant population that is begun to become more and more mainstream. I mean, certainly they are dominating the cities and uh, for the first time in American history in 1920, more people live in the cities or what you would call an urban area than live in the countryside. And uh, you've got people that are coming to those cities, even of American births, uh, like uh, uh, the African American community through the Great Migration. And a lot, maybe not a lot, but but certainly some of that culture is beginning to seep into the mainstream of American life. And so what you begin to see are people of the um, older generation, uh, people that are of the native-born variety, certainly of the Anglo uh, variety, uh, and, and people that don't live in the cities, people in the rural um, uh, countryside, the periphery, that are really be going, going to become resentful of this new urban culture that begins to emanate from the cities, a culture that they feel is is not American, or at least they they feel that there was once upon a time this golden age in the United States, and uh, what these newcomers are doing is they're they're, they're really eroding that golden age uh, of American culture, of American values, of what it means to be an American, who an American is, what an American looks like. Okay. I'm going to point to a couple different examples that will really um, illuminate, or at least I hope it does, illuminate this whole process of uh, the culture wars. The first is going to occur in 1925. In 1925, uh, the school district of Dayton, Tennessee, again, the rural countryside, is going to outlaw the teaching of Darwinian evolutionary theory. Now, those of you that uh, have taken a science class, I bet you've heard of this guy, Charles Darwin, who wrote this really famous book in the mid-19th century called The Origin of Species, in which he argues that plants and animals, organisms generally speaking, uh, are constantly evolving. And the ones that evolve best, most efficiently, and are able to adapt to their surroundings best, those are the ones that thrive. Okay. Now, Darwinian theory, then now and every time in between, challenges fundamental beliefs that strike at the heart of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And so one of the things that, that organizations like the Dayton um, Public School Board felt it was doing was standing up for what had heretofore, before the 1920s, been traditional American values, the idea, mythology or not, that America was founded on Judeo-Christian uh, values, which is probably more myth than not, but nonetheless. Um, 
what happens is is clearly is is very clearly a violation of free speech and academic freedom. Okay, uh, the idea that you've got the school board telling teachers what they can teach in the classroom, what they cannot teach in the classroom. Um, one of the organizations in American life that knows this is a clear cut violation of the Constitution is the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, still around today, the ACLU. Uh, uh, stands up for things like free speech and civil liberties in American life. And so they clearly see red flags associated with this Dayton school district that's banning um, uh, the, the teaching of evolutionary theory in its public schools. So along comes a guy by the name of John Scopes. Uh, he's a biology teacher and he teaches evolutionary thought in a high school biology class and the school board has him arrested for it. This is exactly the kind of opportunity that the ACLU had been waiting for, and so what they do is they hire one of the best defense attorneys that money can buy, a guy by the name of Clarence Darrow, D-A-R-R-O-W, Clarence Darrow. Now, Clarence Darrow, uh, when the case goes to trial, one of the things that he tries to do is illuminate the idea that, that that science or excuse me religion cannot be proven faith cannot be proven it's not empirical data okay it's not testable data and so to that end he put a star witness on the witness stand now I don't expect you to get all the details of what would later become known as the scopes monkey trials but just listen to my story the star witness is none other than the prosecuting attorney uh, a guy by the name of um, William Jennings Bryan. Now, if the name sounds familiar, it's because we've talked about William Jennings Bryan. We talked about him in the context of the populists and the agrarian revolt and the idea of social equality or lack thereof. And so, really, you've got two people that are standing up for very principled issues in American life. I mean, uh, Darrow for the idea of free speech and Brian for the idea of everybody ought to be at the same starting line or at least have an equal opportunity or at the very least on paper uh, and if we allow these uh, industrial monopolists to continue to do what they're doing to the American uh, uh, political system we're never gonna have that so you've got two really good guys that are going at it in the courtroom now the reason that Darrow chose Brian to put up on the witness stand was because he was considered to be a biblical expert. He knew the Bible inside out, upside down, and backwards. Okay, And what Darrow would do is he would ask uh, uh, Brian to explain one thing or another in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Uh, explain to me how Jesus turns water into wine. Uh, explain to me how Moses is able to part the Red Sea. And the essence of faith is you either have it or you don't. And there's no great way of scientifically demonstrating that. Okay? It's just something that you fundamentally believe. The end of the Scopes Monkey Trials, which were named the Scopes Monkey Trials because, as most of you know, um, the idea of Darwinian theory as it relates to human beings is that humans are the descendants of primates, of monkeys, of apes. And so when this case went to trial, uh, it was nicknamed the Scopes Monkey Trial for the idea that we were the descendants of monkeys. But anyway, um, there's, there's really no winners. Uh, Scopes is convicted. Uh, later on, his sentence is commuted, but he, he's, he's not a winner. Um, and evangelical Christians were not winners either. Um, in fact, Darrow had done such a thorough job of humiliating religious people people that really felt strongly that the government ought to take a proactive role in enforcing morality, enforcing uh, these um, uh, what they felt were traditional American values but were traditional Christian values. Uh, he had humiliated them so thoroughly that they were so embarrassed that they really never showed their face in American politics, at least electoral politics, for generations. I mean, it's really not going to be until the late 1970s. So you've got from 1925 to 1978, 1979, before evangelical Christians are really going to become uh, a powerful political force in American life once again. 
So the Scopes Monkey Trials are an extension of these culture wars uh, pitting secular urban liberals uh, against native-born uh, social conservatives uh, that um, it's, it's a more or less a contest of the uh, how, how mainstream American culture is going to function heretofore. Now, another example I'd like you to be mindful of would be the rise and flourishing of the KKK. Now, I alluded to this in an earlier lecture, the idea that the Klan is really revived in the 1920s. It's modeled after that Civil War era KKK, but this is a different animal, so to speak. It's different in a lot of ways. Number one, it's far more sophisticated from a political standpoint in the 1920s than it is in the 1860s or 70s. In the 1860s and 70s, it's more or less a terrorist organization. Now, don't get me wrong. The Klan is still burning crosses. It's still bombing buildings and schools and churches and so forth uh, in the 20s. But it's also a very politically sophisticated organization that has important and intricate ties to the mainstream political system. The other really key difference is the location where the Klan becomes very mainstream. It's becoming mainstream in places like Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, in Indiana in the 1920s, if you didn't have some loose affiliation with the Klan in some way, shape, or form, it was tough to get elected dog catcher, let alone anything else. Why? Well, in the 20s, the Klan really broadened its scope of hate. Now, they still hated African Americans, but in addition to African Americans, they said that they hated Jews and Catholics. Well, who's coming to places like Chicago and Cleveland, Detroit, New York, uh, Chicago? Well, Jewish immigrants and Catholic immigrants. Those are two very major groups that are coming. They hate radicals like socialists and anarchists and later communists. Uh, where are those movements, the socialists, the communist movement, where are they kind of ground zero? Well, Chicago, New York, Detroit. Um, they hate labor agitators and labor organizers, unionists. Where's the union movement really beginning to emerge? It's the cities. So once again, you, you see this uh, native-born, um, uh, socially conservative movement that's emanating from the countryside, from the rural part of the country, that's butting heads against this rapidly changing uh, society that's emanating from the cities, okay? Um, last example would be the 1928 um, presidential campaign of Al Smith, okay? Now, Al Smith was a Democrat. The reason that you never heard the name Al Smith before, probably anyway, is because his ticket, his bid for the uh, presidency, got absolutely obliterated by the Republican, a guy named Herbert Hoover. Now, um, a couple things that I'd like you to be mindful of when it comes to Al Smith. He was the descendants of immigrants, okay? And so from the perspective of social conservatives, especially those that live, are living in the rural part of the country, this makes him an easy target. Hoover was from Iowa. He was a farm boy. Uh, Smith was the descendants of immigrants, so clearly that made Hoover the, the favorite when it comes to social conservatives from that standpoint. Um, additionally, Hoover, or excuse me, um, Smith was a wet. Now, we, we've just talked about prohibition, and if you described yourself as a wet, that meant that you were an opponent. You did not favor the idea of the federal government banning the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages. Well, Smith said, how can you really call yourself a free country if you've got the government telling people what they can consume and what they cannot consume? Well, what groups of people are alcohol really important to, most important to? The Catholics, the Jews, they have a completely different understanding of what alcohol is, what it means, and how it should be used in American life than the native-born Protestant communities in the United States do. So it matters much more to the immigrant uh, conglomerations of voters than it does for native-born uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in the United States. Now, one of the things that Smith was attacked for, you know, over and over and over again, continuously, is the idea if you, if you elect Al Smith uh, president, it's going to be the moral decay, the moral degeneration of the United States. 
The people that were instrumental in getting the Volstead Act uh, prohibition passed like to tell themselves that what they were doing is really striking a blow for the morality of the United States, when in fact, whether they were willing to admit it or not, there were clear racial and ethnic underpinnings that uh, were, were, were going hand in hand with this idea of prohibition. As I've already outlined, it was clearly more important, alcohol that is, was clearly more important to these immigrants that are coming over from places like Southern and Eastern Europe uh, than they were to white Anglo-Saxon native-born Protestants. Um, and so if you're following along with me on that last slide, there is a political cartoon that uh, the caption reads, uh, a cabinet meeting, presidential cabinet meeting, if Al were president. And if you look to the right hand of that um, image, you'll see Al Smith as the waiter. Uh, and he's serving up a big jug of alcohol. We don't know exactly what it is. It's just got XXXX on it. Uh, so we assume that it's whiskey or uh, uh, moonshine or you know gin, something along those lines. And if you look and see who he's serving it to, looks as if there's the Pope at the back or the head of that uh, table. In addition to being the descendants of immigrants, in addition to being a, uh, a wet, an opponent of prohibition, he was also Catholic. And those of you that stick around for the class are going to find out that one of the things that the first Catholic president uh, would have to overcome, J Jack Kennedy, was what his Catholic religion meant to him. There's a lot of people that believe that if Jack Kennedy was elected president in 1960, he's going to take his marching orders not from the American people, but from the Pope. That's the exact same thing that Al Smith was attacked for. That if you elect this guy, he's somehow not American. He's not very American because he's Catholic. And, you know, can we really trust these Catholics when, uh, if you're Catholic and you're, you're a devout Catholic, you, you view the Pope as God's representation on earth, and how can you be loyal to anybody else? So that's one of the other things that Al Smith's being attacked for. And Al Smith and his presidential bid is another really good example of the culture wars of the 1920s, considering it's pitting these urban liberals uh, urban secularites, non-religious people, against people from the countryside, uh, native-born uh, social conservatives that are desperately trying to hold on to the mainstream of American culture, uh, don't really appreciate this rapid amount of social change in the United States in the, uh, in the 1920s. Now let me end by saying this. Al Smith does go down in defeat in 1928, and it's not very close, but one of the things that I need you to understand is he does very well in the cities, and he does even better in working-class immigrant districts. So, in the short term, the Republicans and the conservatives, social conservatives, I guess I should say, are quite successful in the sense that their guy is president of the United States, but the demographics are clearly moving in favor of candidates like Al Smith. Uh, he might not be the best Democratic example to point to when it comes to the Democratic Party, but his views on alcohol, his views on what freedom ought to or ought not to consist of, his views on a pluralistic, multicultural um, America are, are, are clearly going to resonate with a dominant, uh, an emerging dominant um, political force in American life, a predominantly urban-based, a predominantly immigrant, or at least the descendants of immigrants, and a predominantly working-class American voting electorate. And so that's what we're talking about, those three examples. That's what we're really talking about when it comes to the culture wars of the 1920s. Now, in our next lecture, what we're going to be talking about is the end of the 1920s, uh, which ironically enough is going to occur in the last few weeks of October in 1929. Um, but all that we've been talking about, this consumer culture and this changing economy and this political orientation where the government's supposed to stay out of the economy, all of these things are going to come together and uh, really produce one of the most important events in American history, and that would be the Great Depression.